Hello everyone and welcome to RJ Sanderson TV. A great pleasure to be with you tonight. We're going to talk tax, we're going to talk about the economy, we're going to talk about that word that everyone wants to avoid and probably fears at the moment, recession. And of course we're going to talk to this man, Roy Sanderson, who joins us as always. Roy. Hey Dave, welcome Great to be back again. Welcome back. It's, uh, it's uncertain times for people at the moment and, uh, and I suppose today we're going to try and answer some of the questions that have come through to you within the last month as people try to navigate these uh, turbulent times. Yes, it's been a difficult month since we last uh, did our first episode, but yeah, very difficult times. What, what's the mood like in the in the community? You deal with lots of individuals and businesses. What's the mood like at the moment? Have people started to see any optimism or are people sort of still pessimistic at the moment? I think there's still a bit of pessimism, especially in Victoria where our, we're mostly based. There's a lot of um, concern about lack of assistance for sole traders and JobKeeper changing and new rules for JobKeeper. So there is hesitancy out there in our business community. And we're going to talk about JobKeeper and also Job Seeker throughout the program tonight. Um, and we welcome people's questions. I think that's uh, one of the things that we wanted to do tonight and in our live broadcast is is to, to throw the throw the uh, the floor open for questions and throw to the floor four questions I should say, because you know that's what this is all about engaging with the community to answer what questions. There's no question that's, that's, uh, that's too silly or too simple. Please, just whatever your questions are, throw them open and I'm going to fire them at you, Roy. Yep, the benefits of being live, um, what's and all, you're going to see the lot. You're going to see the lot. Uh, and we've got uh, some great guests uh, coming up in the program. We're going to hear from Paul Worsling from uh, iFish and also John Shaw from Ray White Real Estate. So some interesting, um, some interesting guests. We're going to chat to, to Paul in particular about... Uh, fishing and how the fishing industry has been affected and real estate with John Shaw, two, two industries that have been both uh, very much affected by the restrictions in COVID-19. It's great to get their, their ideas on what has happened and uh, what the ideas are going forward. Okay, let's get into our news headlines, Roy, because that's, uh, I suppose, what we do on RJ Sanderson TV each week is, is try and dissect some of the news that's uh, out and about. And the first thing that we heard from the Premier yesterday was around Victorian uh, grants for businesses. What do we know in this space? So it's, it's interesting. The Premier has made a real effort to put money out there. Um, money is going to hospitality for people to um, restaurants to spend money on tables and chairs and have an outdoor eating area, which is fantastic. Money is going to the south, uh, the ski resorts. So if you have a ski resort, you're going to get some funding because nobody's allowed to go to the resorts. Um, chambers of Commerce and Business Associations are being offered um, up to $20,000 to spend money with their memberships, uh, their business memberships. Payroll tax has been deferred for 12 months, so that's a good thing from a cash flow point of view. There's going to be some training workshops run and there's going to be money spent on um, TAFEs, upgrades and export incentives. But then when that all got announced, the biggest thing that was noticeable was sole traders had been left off the equation. Mm. And a lot of pressure was being put to Dan Andrews about what are you doing for sole traders. He's then come out with a second stage of things that has said sole traders will have a grant of up to $3,000 uh, if you are affected or severely affected through uh, due to lockdown. The trouble is, all we have at the moment is a uh, media release. We don't have the legislation or the regulations yet. And in that media release, it has a condition that says the sole trader must actually be renting a commercial space. Now, most sole traders, most yeah. of our clients, they yeah. work from home. So it excludes the plumber, the carpenter, the guy mowing the lawns. They don't need to rent a commercial space mm. and they're going to be left out of these grants. We're seeing, we're seeing a lot of this type of policy where, it, you know, governments are being forced to rather than say, hey, this is a policy that fits everyone, they're really being forced to, 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 to drill down into each industry. And we're seeing some industries that are on the, on the, the, the better side of that and some that are on the worst side of that. How, how difficult is this job for government and, and how are they going at the moment? I think government, federal and state, and I don't like to talk politics, but federal and state have done overall a good job, but they've made mistakes. And this is the first time for Australia and the world to do this. So they will make mistakes. But I think to exclude the sole traders mm. and small businesses is the, the back of the economy. 
And we know that Victoria makes up 25% of the Australian economy. And if the sole traders make up a big proportion of that, then they need to give more to the sole traders. And forget this override or this rider that says you must be renting commercial space. That's wrong. Fair. OK. And just quickly on the, on the grants, the tax implications for, for, for businesses that do receive a grant, how are they taxed? Yep. So JobKeeper, if you're getting JobKeeper, is no GST on it, so GST free, but it is taxable income. Uh, state government grants, the 10,000 one which just expired last night at midnight, um, that's tax free. So you just need to make sure you're getting the right advice on those. The, the, that's, that's the point. If, you, if you're unsure, make sure you seek uh, professional advice on the, on the taxation of that one. The next topic that we want to get into is, you mentioned it there, JobKeeper and JobSeeker, because there are some changes that are imminent on both of those fronts. And again, we encourage people to ask your questions via the comments on the Facebook live stream. Make sure you do send through any, any questions or, or, or any um, comments that you do have. But uh, the turnover test, what's changing for, for JobKeeper at the moment, Roy? So the turnover test um, will come into play on, at the end of September. And what you will have to do is you need to check that your September quarter, the turnover that goes on your BAS, is at least 30% down compared to your September quarter 2019. That will allow you, if it is down 30%, that will allow you to get JobKeeper for the months of October, November, December. So it's important that you know before you get to the end of September how much your turnover is, how much you're invoicing, how much you're receiving before you get to the end of the month. Plan it carefully, plan it properly because that will determine if you get JobKeeper for an extended three months. You can then get it for another three months but that will be a turnover test at the end of December. Right. And, 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 you, and we also just saw on that graphic there that there are some slight changes to the actual number that people are getting. So we've seen that changes to, to the, the person that uh, is part-time now, um, you can see there that if it's, fi it's 1,500 reduced to 750 per fortnight for part-time under 20 hours per week and also a, 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 a slightly lower rate for full-timers. Yes, this is about the government trying to wean us off the JobKeeper, which is a good thing. So 1,500 to 1,200 makes sense. But the 750 for part-timers, um, you've got to be doing less than 20 hours. If you're doing less than 20 hours, and this was one of the mistakes in JobKeeper 1.0, somebody, a young kid be, could be earning $50 and then get 750 if he'd work, you know, long term. So mm. this is fixing one of those uh, irregularities. And uh, I suppose we're going to see... Um to some of the uh, economic, I suppose, um, the economic factors that have changed in spite, well, well, in relation to JobKeeper and JobSeeker as we move on to topic three, which is the recession. Um, we are officially in recession now. We spoke about this the last time uh, that we were on RJ Sanderson TV, Roy. Um, what does that mean? What does the official recession mean now? So recession means that we have negative growth for at least two quarters. Um, that we said on we said last month that even though it wasn't official, we were definitely there because Victoria was still in lockdown. And the fact that Victoria, as I said earlier, makes up 25%, this recession will go on for a little bit longer. I don't know if it will go to a depression, which is um, statistically means um, five, uh, but it's definitely um, uh, in a recession. The Treasurer announced that it was a 7% drop and they had forecast a 10% drop. So, interesting that it wasn't as high as been forecast by Treasury. So, better than expected. We're going to have a look at some of the Australian growth uh, numbers because, as you said, we haven't had many recessions in Australia. You can see there, most of those uh, bars on, on the graph are going up. But it, it is just sort of difficult to see. There is definitely two um, periods of negative growth there. So, we are in recession. And one thing I wanted to sort of show, that we, we, we wanted to show on this is that um, it's not a, it's not a, a, a uh, it's it's not a different story around the world. We're not um, unique in this sense. You can see there if you look closely at the graphs that it kind of falls off the cliff all around the world. What is interesting though there is that China and India graph in the in the top right quarter there that you can see. China was one of the countries that went through COVID nineteen. Uh, prior to everyone else, they were slightly earlier in there in in that story, and you can see that 
the growth has started to go up again, that V-shaped recoveries, which is what we hear economists talk about a lot. So perhaps that lends, I suppose, some, or that gives us a little bit of optimism moving forward that potentially when the restrictions ease, we can do that as well. It's important that we go out and spend. And speaking, and speaking of spending, let's have a look at this graph because we can see here household income and consumption. You can see there, if you look in the bottom there, the saving ratio is actually improving. We can see that it's, it, it's increasing. So that is one of the interesting nuances of this recession. It, it's almost counterintuitive, Dave, to what we expect. We're expecting people are out of work. How could savings possibly increase? How is that possible? Mm. The reality is that because of JobKeeper, people are getting paid some money, better than unemployment benefits, um, and they're not spending because we can't, in Victoria, we can't go out, but we're not spending. So therefore, we're actually got more saving and we have more money in the bank. It's going to come down to our mental capacity to go, the COVID's finished, will we go out and spend or will we tuck this away in the bank and save it in case there is another epidemic down the track? And, and we, talked about, um, we talked about one of the factors driving that last time, that word confidence. So, I mean, again, it, it's going to come down to government giving confidence to to businesses, to individuals, and, and how they do that is probably, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult task for the policy makers. It is, because um, no jobs will mean people won't spend. So we need to have absolute confidence in the market. And it might be a vaccine that will be required before we get that confidence, say, mm. this won't happen again. Mm. Now we'll go out and, and spend money. We're seeing some, some interesting policies being floated uh, within the press, things like uh, restaurant vouchers or, 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 um, or, or, you know, spending vouchers. That, I suppose, is in line with what you're saying, to try and promote that spending so that people do go out and, and, and try and spend on, on local businesses. They say that restaurant vouchers have worked in England. They used it and they, local councils were actually handing the vouchers out to spend locally. Um, I think that um, I put it to Josh Frydenberg uh, in a correspondence to him that I recommend that the government, while they're working on the budget, they should consider getting rid of fringe benefits tax on meals and entertainment. Encourage businesses to go out, take people out for lunch. I'll call it, I'll put a logo on it, I'm going to call it Bring Back the Boozy Lunch. Yeah. <laughs> because businesses can go out and spend money and get rid of this thing called fringe benefits tax, even if it's only for 12 months, two years, whatever it is, to make people have no barriers to going out and spending money at restaurants and um, entertainment venues. Well, we'll put the call out to, to the Treasurer and we'll tell him that uh, potentially next time you can come on RJ Sanderson TV to, to give his thoughts and we'll, we'll put that, uh, that proposition to him. But I think, uh, yeah, an interesting, an interesting uh, proposition that uh, fringe benefits tax could be, I suppose, there, there could be a temporary relief from it to allow people to go out or businesses to go out and spend. That's what we're pushing for. Speaking of businesses, I want to talk about this juncture between hobbies and businesses. So... There's a lot of people that have that have found that during their time in isolation, they've had nothing else to do, and they've found that oh, you know, actually, I'm not a, not not a bad candle maker, or I've you know, I've been uh, sewing plenty of stuff. I might start selling this stuff. So we're starting uh, from from what you've told me, Roy. We're starting to see some people who are starting to find that their business has gone from hobby or their their interest has gone from hobby to business. What's this transition like, and what are some of the questions you're getting? It's I think it's come about partly because people are looking for avenues to make a little bit of extra money, or it may be they want to change careers. The common question we have had is, it's, is it a business or is it a hobby? So there's an easy answer to this. If you're making money, you're making a profit, the tax office will treat you as a business. If you are losing money, then it's a hobby because you don't go into business to lose money. So, it's not a very fun hobby. No, but, the, no, and not, but a hobby that loses business, then it can't be a business because it's losing money. So the tax office will look at it and say, it will be a business if you're making a profit. So any profits will be taxed. That's the reality of it. And the second question we get on the back of that is, well, what tax do I pay on my business income, which is now a business, not a hobby? And that depends a little bit on what your other income is. If you have no other income, then you can earn 18200 and pay no tax at all as per the, the slide there. But if you actually have another job and you're earning between 37,090 and you go and earn $1,000 um, making candles or making masks, which has been quite common, then you'll pay 32.5% on that tax, on that income, plus Medicare levy, so it's 34.5%. So 
You just need to plan. There's not one answer fits everybody. Look at your other income to work out how much tax you should put aside for your business or hobby income. Okay. Well, sage advice there because you don't want a tax debt at the end of the year. You want to make sure you put put that away. So I think uh, that that's a it's an interesting point. We're going to see more and more people whose hobbies, I mean, they're there's always an upside to every downside, Roy, and we're going to see some people whose hobbies are going to flourish into good businesses, so probably some interesting, important advice that they should be aware of. Yes, and we uh, do have a guide for clients who are looking at starting a new business, which you can get from our website if you want it. Just go to the website, um, and it will help people looking at going into a new business. Fantastic. All right, let's move on to topic five, which is tax return amendments, Roy, because one of the things that um, one of the things that we saw last time, and I want to bring this this quote to to our viewers' attention. We we read this last time. This is from ATO Assistant Commissioner Karen Fote. She says, "So far, we're looking at record-breaking tax time in terms of lodgement numbers. But one thing we don't want to see is record-breaking number of easily avoidable errors. How are the people tracking? We've been we're a month further progressed into tax time. How are people?" Tra tracking, are you starting to see that um, you know you you guys are having to un undo some of the mistakes made? So we we have found that a lot of people are taking the easy route and just clicking on uh, lodge it themselves on uh, the MyGov account, and unfortunately they're leaving a lot of money on the table because they're not considering the deductions. They're not putting in home office and telephone and internet and donations and things that an accountant's going to ask you. So what we've actually started doing, it, and it started probably. Uh, more than a month ago, but clients have come to us and said, I've lodged my tax return, I've realised I didn't get as much as what I normally get, but I really needed the money. What can we do? Well, we can look at that. With your permission, we can jump online, see what you claimed, and work out whether it's worth doing an amendment to get a bigger refund. Just work out if it's worthwhile. So you can... So the... the the, I suppose the takeaway from that is, though, if you do make a mistake, don't panic. You can you can undo the mistake um, if, you, if they come and see you. We can fix it and we can improve your refund. But if we can't improve your refund, we're not going to charge you to have a look at it. So okay. it's about making sure it's right. So it's worth. So if you've got a question, it's worth jumping on the website, getting in contact, and uh, and asking that question because you Correct. might be leaving money on the table. Correct. What about GoFundMe? We're seeing a lot of people that are sharing GoFundMe pages. Um, that uh, I suppose allows people to donate to a cause that they see fit, how are they treated by the tax department? Because we know that deductions are generally tax deductible, but are they, um, is GoFundMe tax deductible? So donations must be to a registered charity, registered with the tax office. GoFundMe pages are often for fantastic causes. It might be somebody with an illness, uh, but unfortunately it's not a registered charity. So any GoFundMe contributions, are not tax deductible. And that has surprised a number of clients that have spent some big dollars on what they thought was a tax deduction, and mm. it's not. OK, well, that's a tra trap for young players there. Uh, so if you, if you are looking to make a tax deductible donation, make sure you make it to a registered charity. We're going to move on to early release of super and some of the implications there in one sec. But I do encourage everyone, make sure, as we've said throughout the broadcast, we have had plenty of questions. I'm just seeing them coming through now. We've had plenty of questions that are coming through on the Facebook comments. So appreciate those. We'll get to them throughout the broadcast, but keep asking those questions. And we will get to them shortly. Early release of super. We saw that we had a record number of people taking out money for their super, and we we, we, we did talk about some of the implications of that and, and what the consequences are into the future. But uh, have we had any... It, it, we, we had a deadline impending, but perhaps some, some change to that one. Yeah, the deadline has been extended um, to the 31st of December this year. We don't encourage people to take money out of super. The impact can be quite huge if you've got a lot of years till retirement. But if you need to put food on the table, then that is an option and you should consider it if that's the reason for it. But you shouldn't take out money from super if it's to buy a big screen TV or to go on a, an Australian holiday when, when we are out of lockdown. So uh, do, it, do it carefully. Think about it first before you actually do it. Um, and you do it on your MyGov account. OK. So, yeah... Make sure you make sure you don't just. It's not just a, a free ATM style uh, transaction. You no. think it can have far-reaching implications. It can, and you actually had to be on JobKeeper, or if you're a sole trader, a drop in turnover by twenty percent, which is not the thirty percent that's been bandied around for everything else. It was twenty percent. So there are conditions to get that, and I think that got forgotten a little bit in the process because I have had clients say, "I did get the super, I didn't realise that there were conditions." Well, 
there are conditions. Well, I think that's just about all the questions. I, I've fired a lot of questions. I think you've done pretty well there, Roy, and the, the viewers at home, they're going to fire some questions off at you. But uh, I think you've done well through our news headlines segment, so it's time now to fire some questions at someone else because Paul Worsling from iFish, he's uh, a man that is very rec recognisable in the, in, uh, in the fishing circles and also on TV, joins us on Zoom. Paul, thanks very much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. How are you navigating the circumstances? Yeah, look, it's making life a little bit tough. Uh, my life revolves around fishing 100% of the time. Uh, that's what we do. That's how we make our living. That's what we love. And uh, when fishing is banned, it sort of puts a bit of a halt on things. Paul, as a retailer, what did you have to do differently because of lockdown? It's probably been the toughest time. Uh, I've worked in the business for 31 years. We celebrate our 31st birthday last week. And I've owned the business for 24 years. And I reckon this has been the toughest period because there's just so many variables. And one thing people don't like, Roy, they don't like the unexpected or not knowing what the future holds. The rules just seem to change so quickly and you never know what's happening next. And you've got staff who look to you for guidance, advice. They're scared as well. So basically what it's meant is you're working five times harder than normal and making absolutely zero dollars, which is difficult and stressful at the best of times. So when we when the door is opened and we're allowed to fish and your store is allowed to go back to normal, is there anything you've learnt that you're going to do completely different when we open up again? I tell you, I, I won't be kissing strangers and shaking hands without sanitizer. <laughs> um, it's just changed the way we think about life, which is sad. I worry for my boy who's... 13 years old, it's just not the way a kid should be growing up. But every time you, you, you have a scenario like this, whether it's the GFC, uh, I'm sure people went through it in the Great Depression many years ago, you just learn to do business smarter because if you don't, you're not going to survive. So we've actually made some serious efforts to look at the way we do business. We want to hold less stock. We want to do more stock turns. We want to become a better business where, where we, we don't just sell stuff, we sell the exact stuff that people want and maybe things they don't even know they want, but we just do things a little bit better than other businesses. Because what this is gonna do, it's only my personal opinion, but I reckon if I reckon if four out of five Victorian businesses reopen, that'll be pretty fair effort because people are just walking away. So we just have to do things better or we won't be here in the future. Paul, um, speaking of the future, I suppose, um do you take any sort of silver lining out of what's happening in other states with, uh, I think, uh, lots of outdoor activities starting to boom as people, I guess, appreciate the, the freedom of the outdoors a bit more? I actually think the industry that I'm in, and I'm fortunate, like it's been a tough, tough six to nine months, but I think anything based on outdoors, caravanning, camping, fishing, living the great Australian dream, I believe when and if we get rid of this plague, they're going to be boom businesses. People are going to want to just do simple things. Granddad's going to want to spend time with his grand boy or granddaughter and just catch a fish. People are going to want to holiday locally, buy a caravan. They want to just spend time. I think it's going to come back to the simple things. So even though it's been horribly tough, I really do think that if, if you structure your business properly and you're fortunate enough to be in those areas of leisure, entertainment, your business could really boom because people are going to come in droves. Paul, uh, looking at what's happened in the past and the government introduced JobKeeper, um, you, it saved a lot of retailers and other businesses. How do you rate it? Do you think it's worked well or any, any problems with JobKeeper? I think JobKeeper is absolutely brilliant. Without it, I would literally be on the bones of my backside and I wouldn't have slept half as much even though I haven't slept a lot. There's a few really simple flaws in it though. We had a situation at one of my stores where a staff member left because he wanted to become a landscape gardener. And I encourage that because our philosophy always is, if a staff member is only a young bloke, if they get an opportunity to better themselves and get a career, then we've done our job along the way. We've just replaced a like staff member, like for like, and now we can't get JobKeeper for this new person who is literally fulfilling a role. So if you've got a manager and then that manager leaves and then you get another manager, why should you not be able to get JobKeeper? Because you're not employing new people, you're employing like for like. So that's one of the flaws. And I think it was also a bit sad that a kid who was making 80 bucks a week all of a sudden got 750 and someone was making two grand a week all of a sudden got 750. So, yep, easy sitting back in my position to go, they made a few mistakes. But overall, I really do think it has saved tens of thousands of Victorian businesses. 
Paul, uh, we really appreciate your time. And, and uh, as you've sort of spoken about, I think there's a there's a boom time coming for you. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Thanks for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Fingers crossed that boom comes soon and lasts a long time. Appreciate your time, guys. Fantastic insight there from Paul Worsling from iFish. And uh, he touched on, well, we touched on there at the end, this idea of boom um, coming off the back of the recession. And, and, and we have had some questions come in, as I, as I mentioned, Roy. One of them comes in from Adam. It says, hi, guys, great show. Do you think Australia will bounce back faster from recession than other countries? Yeah, good question, Adam. Um, I think China's bounced back relatively quickly because they had the hardest lockdown of all countries. They did it hard, they did it quick. Um, I certainly hope so, and I, I suspect we will, um, certainly more than a lot of countries, because one of the things Australia seems to be trying to do is they're trying to eradicate this COVID-19. Other countries, like the US, they're saying the economy is more important. So their numbers per day are in the thousands and thousands Ours are so much lower. So I suspect we will bounce back a lot quicker than a lot of countries. OK. So some interesting insights there. We'll have to obviously wait and see. But, uh, yeah, let's hope that that's the, that's the case. Let's hope that we do bounce back. Um, Roy, after last episode, there's, there's been a few things you haven't been happy about. That's fair to say? Oh, yes. There have been. So you came in, you gave me a call, you said, Dave, I want my own segment and I want to call it Roy's... Rage, and that is exactly what we're going to do right now. This is Roy's rage. Roy, what has got you up and about this week? Well, I'll tell you what I'm raging on about. Um, <laughs> the Dan Andrews, and, and this is not political, but there is a public holiday that's been announced for a grand final in Victoria. Victoria is the only state that has it, and it, the public holiday has been moved to October when the grand final is expected to be, but there is no grand final parade in Victoria. There is no grand final in Victoria. So I would argue, Mr Andrews, please put the holiday aside, park it, and park it till we're all back and we're not staying at home and we're well away from it and put it on a Friday when we can call it a getaway Victoria weekend and make it a long weekend. But we, business, do not need a public holiday right now. Just a, a, and, and, and a very passionate, uh, very passionate plea, and uh, we will put that to Mr Andrews if he de does join us on RJ Sanderson TV at some stage in the future. But just for our audience as well, why are public holidays um, detrimental for businesses at times like this? Like, what, why is it a detrimental thing? So Victoria has one public holiday more than all the other states, and why it's detrimental is because we as an employer, and I say we, but employers need to pay all their staff for that day, but we get zero productivity if they're, they're at home. It's, mm. it's a day off. But if there's an employer that's in hospitality who are hammered at the moment, then they have to be paying double time and time and a half, uh, double time and a half. So the hourly rates for certain industries that have to stay open is through the roof, but it's not fair on business because without businesses, we don't have jobs. Without jobs, we don't have income in people's pay packets. So I think that the, the um, Dan Andrews just needs to reassess it and say, OK, this is not the right time. So many people are spending time at home as it is. We don't need a public holiday to be paid full hourly rate to be at home. OK, interesting comments. And you do have one more thing that you wanted to mention because there are some traps for young players, and this is a slightly different tangent, but there are some traps for young players out there in the investment market. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to share um, a slide. There... There is um, an organisation who's offering this amount of money for term deposit. Now, I'm not going to name the organisation, but the reality is this. The top four banks are lending, on average, for term deposits at around 1%, just under 1%. That's the average of the four banks. Now, if we have a non-bank institution, not government guaranteed, borrowing money from the public at 4.5%, this is borrowing money from the public and then lending money to the public as to the public as per their website at somewhere around 3.25%. What business structure, what business model is this? How long will this business last? And this is a second tier non-government guaranteed financial institution trying to get deposit money in to, to so they can lend it out at a lower rate. It doesn't make sense. It scares me. 
I've lived through and seen a couple of collapses at second tier level. I don't want it to happen again and I don't want people to lose money like they did out of Geelong where there was a um, building society that went broken, lots of destroyed lives. So my message, my warning, don't go out there looking for the highest interest rate. Dig a little deeper and see whether that's really what you should be, where you should be putting your money. Whew. Take a deep breath, Roy. That was Roy's rage and what a start that was. Uh, Roy's just going to cool down now and we're going to have a chat to John Shaw because John is from Ray White and the real estate industry, as we know, has, uh, has suffered uh, like many other industries and we want to chat to, to John about uh, how he and his business are navigating the times. John, thanks for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. How are you navigating these times? Well, our sales team aren't navigating it at all. They've, they're a boat without a paddle. Uh, our rental division is uh, is going gun ho I actually did some sums just before uh, we spoke, and we have let, I think it's 30 properties in the last five weeks because we had a chance to uh, video vacant ones. So people are quite happy to rent a property without actually attending it. That's a whole different kettle of fish for someone trying to buy a property. So, John, over the last five weeks or so while in lockdown, it's very slow in the sales department? Well, there is no sales department, Roy. It's, um, uh, this, all we're doing right now is talking to our customers and saying, hey, as soon as we can get you out of this, we will. We've got people who are desperate uh, to sell, who've purchased. Uh, there's nothing we can do. We can't take anyone through. And uh, so we're talking to those people, well, not, not daily, but certainly as, as fast, much as we can, uh, and our customers who are waiting to buy, we're just saying we're waiting for the day that we can get you through a property. And so we're talking to them as well. So we're just trying to keep all those people happy and, uh, and not too frustrated. So spring is normally your gun time, money-making time. Um, given that we have lockdown, we don't actually know when it's going to happen. There's uh, estimated dates, but it's all based on numbers. What are yeah. you, what's the best you can hope for, given that we're already into spring? Well, it's interesting, Roy. The rest of Australia, um, because we're part of a franchise group, the rest of Australia is in a massive, and I'm not going to say a boom, but they're in a purchasing frenzy. Uh, so Ray White last month had their biggest month in history as far as sales go, excluding Victoria. So it seems to be when you come out, and most of the other states have been out of it for a little while now. So it seems to be when you come out of it, there's going to be an influx of, of lots and lots of people and uh, wanting to buy and uh, hopefully for the regional areas, uh, that's next week maybe or the week after, I think. Yeah, John, that's a point that we have touched on uh, throughout the show is this prospect of a, a sort of V-shaped recovery. Um, how are you guys yeah. at Ray White sort of preparing for that and, um, and, and what are the type of conversation you're having with uh, potential buyers and sellers at the moment like? Well, that, as I said, I think it's, it's just a matter of... Uh, when uh, and hopefully it's soon. Uh, maybe we should have had the dog groomer boss talk to the government for us. Um, he seemed to have got somewhere where nobody else did. Um, but I, I just I, I can't see the difference personally between me going shopping today in Woolworths with probably 200 people to one person turning up to a house where and we were practicing this ages. Ago, we were practicing this in goodness me, whenever it was April. Uh, wash your hands out the front walk through, don't touch anything, the people have left, and you come out, and then the next person comes in. So I, I just, anyway, it doesn't matter. I, you, I, I don't get it, but um, how, we, how are we coping? How are our customers? I think our customers are more frustrated than we are. Um, we'll get through this, there's no doubt. Um, we're good times, bad times, people still buy and sell property. Um, but uh, our, our people that have already purchased, or I've got a chap that's gone to Mildura, he's purchased up there. Um, he's, he's, his property's vacant. It's just crazy that we can't do anything for him and we can't until uh, the Premier says you can. John, Ray White, Chelsea um, is a, a big... But you're part of a bigger group and maybe uh, the demand at Chelsea with lockdown isn't that big, but maybe around the bigger group and rest of Australia, what are most of the buyers? Are they first-home buyers, um, you know, people moving up? What are the... Who are the purchasers? So, uh, looking at Metro? Yeah, Metro. Or everywhere? Metro and, yep. and then everywhere. Uh, there is an influx of people who are 
talking to regional officers. I think this whole thing of what well, we've all learned a new way and you don't have to be in an office. Areas like Warrnambool, uh, were, a guy was telling me in Ballarat, uh, the new train will take 50 minutes to get from Ballarat to the CBD and from Frankston to the CBD is an hour and a bit. So I, I think regional areas are hitting, going to hit a real boom as far as that goes. Uh, so there's a lot of people looking out. There'll also be a lot of people looking in. The first home buyers are still getting a grant, so they're all looking at that. And also self-managed super funds. Uh, they're, they're looking at purchasing real estate now, too. well, trying at the, as soon as they can. So that uh, self-managed super funds is something that we get a lot of inquiry about mm. um, from the investor market. So there's still investors sitting on the fence thinking now's a good time to buy? Oh, I, I, with an investment, it's totally different to a house, uh, a, a purchase for your own property to live in. Um, your own property to live in is where you go and find something to buy that you love, hopefully, and you're going to be there for the next 20 years. So I, I always, when I'm coaching people at buying, it doesn't matter what you pay for that. Uh, where it, When it becomes an investment property for a self-managed super fund or whichever investment you're going to put that through, then that's just numbers. So that's where can I get the best growth, where can I get the best return, and how much money have I got to spend. And usually it works on train lines, Roy, which is uh, the closer to the city, the dearer the real estate, but the closer to the city, the better the capital growth and the better the rent. John, uh, really appreciate your time today on RJ Sanderson TV. Thanks for your time. Um, the dog grooming lobbyist is awaiting your phone call and hopefully you have some luck uh, wait. with your lobbying efforts. Thank you. And thanks for getting me into a business shirt for the first time in six weeks. <laughs> yes, it, it's a, it was a nice crisp shirt there, John. So, uh, again, thank you so much for your time on RJ Sanderson TV. Roy, we've had plenty of questions that have come in and I want to get to, to some of them um, before we get to your tax tip to close out things. Um, and one of the questions that we've had in, come in from Michael says, Hi, guys. We're in the building and construction sector. Wondering your thoughts, how will this impact the industry with no migration to Victoria, Australia? Will we catch up with the property demand and what impact will it have on property prices? Yeah, Michael, good question. Um, very difficult because property prices in Australia have grown on the back of demand and we've had one of the highest influxes of immigration across all the Western countries. So I think on memory, last time I looked, we were 1.9% growth just from immigration and we were number one in the world. So that was driving property prices. And with no immigration, it could have effect on demand, but I still think um, it comes down to whether you're building enough homes for the people we have to live in them. And if you look at the graphs between the building stats and those that, um, uh, the growth in the population, there is still a fair gap for that to be caught up. So I think if I, if I um, take what is being said by Real Estate Institute of Victoria, there is going to be a drop in uh, house prices. I don't think it's going to be around for very long. In my life as a, a dealing in real estate and giving advice to people buying real estate, um, I've often heard about the doom and gloom. And when there's a drop in property, history shows it's so temporary and it's so small. So I think, Hold your nerve, Michael. Um, sit on the fence. I'd be looking to buy something fairly soon in case there is a bit of a drop in the market. I don't think it's going to be 10 or 15%. I think we might be talking 3 to 5%. There will be some opportunities as JobKeeper winds down, um, but I don't think there will be any long-term effect at all on the property price market. We've had another question come in that I want to ask you from Greg Jennings. It says, what's the deadline for tax return and lodging it? That's the first part of the question. I'll let you answer that. Yep. So if you do your own tax return, Greg, and hopefully you do not because you know better, <laughs> it would have been the 31st of October. But because you use a tax agent, we have until uh, 15th of May next year. So, But if you're looking for your refund, don't leave it till May. Um, you've got plenty of time is what I'd argue rjsanderson.com.au for you, Greg. Uh, and the second part of that question, given the current climate, what can you claim for work from home and are there any limits? So work from home started, uh, COVID started uh, 1st of March. So you've got about 16 weeks there that you can claim at 80 cents per hour working from home. That 80 cents covers your stationery, your light and power, your internet. Um, prior to that, working from home was at uh, 52 cents per hour. So we work this out. The 52 cents per hour doesn't include those other things. So sometimes 
while COVID has been on, we've had to work out, is it better to use 52 cents plus claim the internet, plus claim home telephone calls, plus any computer equipment or chairs or desks, and they will be better at 50, and claim 52 cents per hour for light and power than the 80 cents per hour. But those are the things I've just mentioned are the main things that an accountant is going to ask you when we're doing your tax return. And even though we're not sitting opposite desk with people to do their tax return, we're doing them all by phone and email. So we're still going to ask all those questions. Greg, rjsanderson.com.au again. That's, uh, that's the takeaway from that. One thing we touched on last time, and we'll, we'll just repeat it, tea and coffee for, for work from home? Tea and coffee is not a tax deduction. And either is toilet paper, which is what I think everybody <laughs> thought, that it, toilet paper must be a tax deduction. Why else would they go out and buy so much of it? That's not a tax deduction, not when it's for home. All right, let's finish off with a bang, Roy. Roy's tax tip is next uh, on our agenda. And uh, we've got a nice little animation there for you again. Roy's tax tip. What's your tax tip? Well, it's about trying to get a bigger refund. And you can spend money to get more money back, but don't waste money to get a bigger refund. But an idea is if you ask your employer to take an additional $10 per week out of your pay in tax, there's $520 extra that you will get back at the end of the year. Make it $20 a week. You've got over a $1,000 extra refund. It's like forced saving. Don't do this if you can't afford to live week to week. But if you don't miss $20, have the boss take extra tax out. It'll come back to you as an additional refund at the end of the year. And, and just on the practical side of that, that's just a conversation with your payroll department at work or, or um, you know, whoever manages that type of thing? Correct. It's totally legal to ask for extra tax to be taken out. You can't ask for less than the scheduled amount, but you can ask for more. Right, there you go. Potentially uh, can add further savings to the, the households that are already saving more than they traditionally are. Hey, Roy, that's all we've got time for tonight and we've had plenty of commentary. We thank all the viewers and, and, and people online for engaging with us. And, you know, if you, if you are watching this in, um, uh, you know, following this broadcast in a non-live circumstances, still ask your questions because, Roy, you'll answer those questions um, via the Facebook page directly. Yeah, correct. Uh, via the Facebook page, and I wanted to mention very briefly, we did have a webinar today, and the question we asked in the webinar is, is the economy stuffed? <laughs> and we got an answer to that, and we had some predictions about where the stock market's going to go, property market, etc. That presentation is now live and available on our website um, under the events page. So if you do go to our website and you want to have a look at that webinar, um, it's no charge and it was a great webinar and we, we had a few hundred people listen to that so it was, it was very well received. That, and that's the question. That's the question on everyone's mind. Is the economy stuffed? So if you want to find out the answer to that, jump on the website and, uh, and watch that one in your time. Yep. And special thank you for Paul Worsling from uh, Tackle World, Mornington and uh, Cranbourne and Ifish and John Shaw from Way Ray White, Chelsea for joining us today. Thanks and, and a special thanks to you, Roy. Thanks for all your efforts and we'll, we'll do it again in a month or so. See you all in a month. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, we will see you next time on RJ Sanderson TV.